Hi, I'm Sebastian Mutz. I'm a climatologist and paleoclimatologist. And today I want to introduce you to proxies in terrestrial paleoclimatology, or as I like to call it, playing the climate detective game. And you'll see why in a minute. Proxies are often described as indirect measurements for climate, and there is a vast number of proxies that are used to reconstruct terrestrial paleoclimate. Now this is a very short lecture, so I won't be able to give you a full overview of all the proxies that are out there, and that's not the goal of this lecture. In this lecture I would like to introduce you instead to a few reasons for why we're interested in reconstructing past climates then to hopefully instill you with a somewhat new conceptual understanding of what climate proxies are, and then to provide you with a few examples of commonly used climate proxies in terrestrial paleoclimatology. So let's jump into the first question. Why are we interested in reconstructing past climates? Now for the prediction of future climates, we rely quite heavily on numerical models. Now these models have been demonstrated to work fairly well for a time period for which we have instrumental measurements. However, there's still some uncertainty about how well climate models are doing in predicting climates of a very different world, climates that are dramatically different, if you will. And this is where climate proxies come in handy, because with climate proxies, we can reconstruct climates for a specific time in the past when we had a very different world. Once we've done that, we can simulate the climate for that same time period using numerical models, and then we can see how well these match. And if they match well, then that gives us more confidence in what numerical climate models are telling us about a future climate in a very different world. It also gives us more confidence in our proxy-based reconstructions, right? So climate proxies help us validate numerical climate models. The second reason along that same sort of line, it's also about contemporary climate change, but this goes back to the concept of the past being the key to the future. There are lessons that we can learn from the past for our future, right? Take the mid-Pliocene, for example. The mid-Pliocene has CO2 levels that are comparable to today's. So studying the climate of the mid-Pliocene gives us some idea of what our future climate could potentially look like. Why are we interested in terrestrial climate? Well, I mean, we live in land and terrestrial climate has the most direct impact on, say, agriculture or mountain glaciers, which are important water reservoirs for Central Asia, South America and beyond. Before we now get into the next section of this lecture, uh, what climate proxies actually are, pause this uh, video for a second and just try to come up with a few more reasons for why we're interested in reconstructing past climates. Now I would like to convince you of two things. The first is that working with proxies is not unlike being a detective. And the second is that proxies themselves are not unlike engineered measurement systems that we find at standard weather stations. Okay, so why is working with proxies a little like being a detective? As a detective, when you're trying to catch your perpetrator, you're looking for clues that tell you something about the activities or characteristics of your perpetrator. Now, wherever whichever environment your perpetrator was in contact with is where they potentially leave behind clues about their activity or their characteristics. So take a set of footprints, for example. They can tell you something about the activity 
of your perpetrator? Was the perpetrator walking or running? They can tell you something about the characteristics of your perpetrator. What is their feet size or at least the shoe size? Now the depth of the imprints can tell you something about the weight of your perpetrator or the weight of something or someone they were carrying. The last one is a little more complicated and we'll return to that towards the end of our lecture. Now think about the climate system. The climate system comprises a series of systems. The atmosphere, of course, then the biosphere, the cryosphere, ice, the land surface and the oceans. And these systems are in constant interaction with each other. So the climate is in contact with a lot of other environments and these environments potentially record clues about the activity or characteristics of climate. Yeah. And this is how it works. Think about some sort of system that reacts sensitively to changes in climate. This change in climate then potentially induces a change in our system state. Now we can describe our system state by state variables. Now if we're lucky enough, the values for these state variables get recorded before the system state change and after the system state change. If that is the case, then we can use these records to infer something about climate activity. Think about a classic thermometer. What's actually going on there? We have a liquid, usually mercury or alcohol, that responds to changes in a climate element that we are interested in measuring, in this case, temperature. Temperature increases, and with an increase in temperature, the volume of the liquid also increases. Now, the volume in this case is our system state variable, and changes in volume let us infer changes in temperature. In case of thermometers, that inference is made simple by forcing the liquid to expand and contract along a glass tube, we put a scale next to it so we can simply read off temperature. For natural measurement systems, inference is a little more complicated. And it's complicated further by the fact that we are often recording changes in several different factors that influence the system state. Right? Think back to the depth of the footprints left by our perpetrator. We came up with two plausible explanations for that. The weight of the perpetrator or the weight of what they were carrying. Now there are other plausible explanations such as a change in the sediment that the perpetrator was walking on. Right? So what is the advantage of using natural measuring systems, proxies? Simply put, they predate humans. Instrumental measurements go back to the mid-1700s. Then we have historical accounts like ship logs or even artistic depictions of extreme events in climate. That goes back to maybe 2000 years. And beyond that, we rely on proxies. Now, the first proxy I want to introduce you to is the stomatal index. Now, if you looked at a leaf in section, it would look something like this. On the outside, you would have a cuticle. Then you would have a layer of epidermal cells. You would have a layer of palisade cells that absorb most of the sunlight. And you would have a layer of spongy cells, which are important for the exchange of gases, more specifically O2 and CO2. These gases enter and leave through stomata. Now, a stoma can be thought of as an opening through which CO2 and O2 can pass. The guard cells that surround the stoma help regulate this exchange. Now, stomatal openings are usually found at the bottom of a leaf, but can also be found at the top at times. So how is this related to climate? Two things that the plant is interested in is to retain water and to make sure it gets enough CO2. Now, a larger number of openings would allow more intake in CO2, but would potentially also lead to more loss of water. Now, in warm climates, CO2 levels are higher and the plant is more at risk of losing water. 
So the plant has to worry less about getting enough CO2, but it has to try to prevent too much water loss. With a lower density of stomata, the plant does just that. Therefore, a lower density of stomata indicates warmer climates with higher CO2 levels. Now cold climates correlate with a lower level of CO2. A high density of stomata maximizes the CO2 intake in a climate in which the plant has to worry less about losing water. The next thing I want to introduce you to are stable isotopes of oxygen. Now oxygen can exist as several different isotopes and the ones that we're interested in are oxygen 18, heavier oxygen, and oxygen 16, lighter oxygen. Or more specifically, we're interested in the ratio of heavier to light oxygen in water because that can tell us something about climate. Now, as water is evaporated at the equator and travels north and south towards the poles, it gets increasingly lighter, meaning it gets increasingly more depleted in heavier oxygen. If you happen to live in a cold climate that permits ice caps to exist at the poles, a lot of that light water gets locked away in ice caps and is prevented from rejoining the ocean. This changes the isotopic composition of the water. Why is this important for terrestrial rainfall? Well, the water has to come from somewhere, from a body of water, and the oceans are the largest bodies of water, right? So this global effect, this ice volume effect, actually influences the starting composition of precipitation that you are observing at a specific location on land. However, there are more things that can happen between the source and where rain actually falls. You can have evaporation, transpiration, you can have air masses being advected onto mountains, forcing orographic precipitation. All of these things change the isotopic composition of the water that still remains in the air. This is important for the next proxy that I want to introduce you to, namely speleothems, or more specifically, stable isotopes of carbonates in speleothems. Speleothems are carbonate deposits that form from water that is supersaturated with CaCO3. That water can originate as rainwater, which makes its way from the surface down into the cave. Examples of speleothems are stalagmites, stalactites, flowstones, and these are all very useful because they have a well-defined stratigraphy and can be dated with uranium series dating. Now their isotopic composition depends on the isotopic composition of the rainwater, as well as everything that happens to the water on its way down from the surface into the cave. And the isotopic composition of the rainwater depends on the many factors that we touched on earlier. So what we would really benefit from are separate lines of evidence that will allow us to eliminate some of these factors as explanations. And this is where I want to return to the example of our perpetrator leaving behind deep footprints for one last time. There were two possible explanations that we found. One was that the perpetrator himself was quite heavy, and the other was that the perpetrator carried something heavy. Now, if we had separate lines of evidence, such as video footage of that person, if on that video footage we saw that they didn't look like a particularly heavy person, then we could eliminate option A, and that would give us more confidence in our interpretation of option B, namely the perpetrator was carrying something heavy. Right? And this is why paleoclimatologists like to use several different proxies or even proxies and models combined to allow a refinement of the interpretation of the observed change in a system. What I would like you to think about after this lecture is to see if you can come up with systems on the Earth's surface that you know are affected by climate 
and think about whether the climate-induced changes could potentially be recorded in the geological record. In other words, try to come up with ideas for proxies and then later check in literature if it actually is used as a proxy. I thank you for your attention and I hopefully see you soon in person.